My name is uh, Tom Knockolds and I'm part of the team at Community Power Agency um, and uh, as, a, as the Secretariat for the Coalition for Community Energy, we welcome you to the next webinar in the series. Um, I'm going to pass you over to our presenter for tonight, Taryn Lane, in just a moment, but uh, a few housekeeping items. Um, we're recording this webinar, so um, if you're not able to make it right through to the end, be aware that we'll be publishing it um, on our website, on the C4CV website, um, probably tomorrow. Um, and uh, we're going to take questions at the end. Uh, so uh, familiarise yourselves with the question and answer panel or the chat panel. Either one of those, I'll have, I'll have an eye on both of them. And um, uh, think about what questions you might have. Feel free to ask them as you go. Um, but we will wait till the end before we, before we uh, have a Q&A session. Um, if you have a problem with where you're not understanding it, not understanding a concept or something, and that's preventing you from uh, uh, following the rest of the presentation, just tell, tell me in the question uh, section that you've got a problem and, and we're, we will interrupt for, for those sorts of questions. Um, so without any further ado, uh, we're really lucky to have uh, Taryn Lane, one of Australia's leading experts in community energy to present tonight. Um, Taryn has been uh, a part of the Hepburn Wind Project um, for, for, since the beginning, um, has, has been part of the team at Embark and recently uh, was a Churchill Fellow and has been traveling around, the, around Europe um, speaking to community energy organizations over there. So um, over to you, Taryn, to introduce what you're talking about and do your presentation. Great, so my apologies, Tom, I've forgotten how to share my screen. Tom? Yes. I've forgotten how to share my screen. That's all right. You'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop sharing my screen. That might, might make it a bit easier for you. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. That makes it easier. Great. Okay, so... Uh, thank you everyone. Thanks for spending some of your time on a Wednesday night. Um, so I'm just going to run through um, the sort of body of work that I put together for my Churchill Fellowship report. Um, I went away from May through to July this year and I was really looking at village scale transitions uh, and 100% renewable examples of those over in Europe. Um, so some of what we'll run through today uh, is a little bit of context, some of the best practice frameworks and methodologies around zero net energy transitions or 100% renewable communities. Um, we'll talk through some of the different scales of transition, the process of zero net energy, some of the key contributing factors and uh, reflections for Australia and then Tom will facilitate some Q&A. So Here's just some, some high level stats. So, um, you know, I spoke to well, probably over 80 thought leaders. Um, I visited a range of villages and, and a few cities um, and I did around 70 visits to operating projects. This is just a, a broad map of the places that I went to, but really it was very focused in Austria, Sweden, uh, Germany, Denmark and the UK. And some of the, the context for you is, so when we think about zero net energy or 100% renewable, it's really about enough generation to offset the local consumption. Um, within Australia, look, we have a, a really strong movement of, you know, states are setting their own state-based targets. We've got the Victorian government with a 40% target by 2025. Um, there's a lot, lots of communities declaring targets, um, but nobody's got there yet. And probably Hepburn Wind is the closest because we delivered um, 
our two turbines, which offsets from our wind farm in Leonard's Hill through to um, Hepburn Springs, so enough for 2,100 homes. And we say it's enough to power the town, um, but really what we'd like to see is our whole municipality um, deliver 100% renewable target uh, as quickly as possible. So because I live in a regional area and I, you know, work on that village scale, my focus was very much on the role of the village um, and how, how communities in Europe have gotten there with high community ownership and a complexity of partnerships and technology. So I was looking for the whole suite um, and I was particularly interested in, you know, the idea of integrated energy community energy systems where there's this grid, uh, you know, potential grid ownership or grid interaction in, in regards to demand management. So, you know, they're also really trying to utilise the load locally um, and different ownership approaches and, and strong social benefit. So in regards to scales of transition, um, the the, the kind of demarcation that I really noticed was around the difference between the role of the village, the role of the island, the role of the city and the role of the region. Um, and in particular, you know, there was really a, a lot of examples about the village scale and the island scale transition um, as being ones that were, uh, you know, potentially a, a lot easier to deliver um, than the city scale. Um, and a lot, a lot of them have gotten there in, especially through Germany and Denmark and Austria. So one of the communities that I visited uh, in Germany is called Saarbeck. Um, and I would really say that they are a lighthouse community. Um, they already have delivered a 350% a, a three, renewable um, target uh, and they're very focused on on carbon neutrality at the moment um, they look you know they bought their grid originally um, so the municipality bought the grid back uh, I think in 2012 um, and they started implementing a strategy when a local uh, army depot holding place uh, came up that the German army wanted to sell it and it was about two kilometers away from the town and so the local community and municipality said, why don't we buy this back and turn it into an energy park? So you can see the image there is actually of the ammunition depot. Um, so instead of kind of attempting to rehabilitate the site in regards to taking down these massive concrete pieces of infrastructure, they covered them in 10 megawatts of solar. So really innovative use of the space. Um, so, so the first project was the solar, but also six wind turbines. So these are large scale wind turbines, they're two megawatts each. Um, so the municipality and the community co-own these, these generators. Um, and from there, a local farmers co-op came, approached um, the park and said, look, you know, the group of us, we would like to have a biogas um, facility on site um, and we're a farm, farmers co-op, uh, you know, producing biomass out on our farms and so they were welcomed onto the site and then the local um, privately owned municipal waste centre asked if they could open up a, a facility on site as well and they, they relocated there um, and then a local uh, disability employment agency um, asked if there could be work for, for local disabled people and 35 local uh, disabled people since then have, have, um, have are employed on site um, doing various activities such as maintenance. Um, a local university then also approached and said, look, we'd like to have an R&D centre here. Um, so yeah, just really, uh, you know, a great in look into a very integrated system. Um, the picture to the right is part of their, their energy trail that they have um, around the village. So when you go into town, you know, close to the energy park, they, you can walk around and it's got this very interactive um, energy trail with these sort of landmarks where you can, um, you have, there's an app and you can get information about them, um, but they also have uh, some information there as well. Uh, so, you know, one of them is this massive cutout in um, tarmac on a roadside where you can, it's acrylic, and you can look down and you can see the district heating pipes and what temperature they're at and how many houses um, they're, they're sort of uh, heating at that moment in time. Um, you can walk over to the community uh, school and see the community solar project on the roof and there's information about, you know, how every year the, the students decide on how to use the profits. Um, 
and what they do with them. So yeah, just a really uh, well integrated project. They're now doing a, um, a range of battery trials on site at the energy parks and they're doing four different battery trials on site. So another one uh, also located in Germany that I thought was a fantastic example um, was Wolfhagen. And again, <clears throat> another community that brought back, uh, community and council that brought back their energy grid. Um, and, you know, they have a, a sort of local energy uh, product. The community owns 25% of the grid. The council owns the balance. Uh, and every project they do is that same split. So 25% community owned, 75% council owned. Um, they, for their local community, there was a lot of protest around uh, the potential for large scale transmission lines to come through the community in order to transport uh, the energy across, across Germany. And they had a lot of protest in their community and they didn't want the large scale transmission towers. So. Uh, they, they opposed that and instead had a plan for energy autonomy, so getting to 100% as quickly as possible. Um, but they had really limited land. So you can see the images there. Um, they were one of the first projects in Europe to um, open up wind in the forest. So these are monocultural forests that are used for, um, you know, uh, for plantation timber and they're sustainably harvested, so they're not super rich, biodiverse areas. Um, yeah, so they, they managed to build the first, uh, one of the first uh, wind farms in a forest. They've got six turbines. Um, since then, they've gone on to do a, a six megawatt project. They're also doing a, um, a variable feed-in tariff program whereby uh, they, they notify people um, how much generation the, the, the local community generators are doing every day in accordance with the weather. So uh, if it's really sunny and windy, they say, hey, you know, between this period, it would be really good if you, if you used uh, your household appliances. And if you do, uh, you can use a really cheap, cheap, you can get a really cheap feed-in tariff. Um, if you don't, we're gonna be pulling electricity from the national grid and it's gonna be more expensive. Um, and they've had great success with that. So the role of the island, the islands were really different again because uh, there's such a big focus on transport. So the ferries to the island, the, the you know, the inner island transport. Um, so transport is a, is a really huge issue for them. It, it makes up, the, you know, almost the majority um, of, their, of their carbon footprint. Um, so Aero Island was a fantastic island. It was the location of the first community owned wind farm. So it's as way back when in the late 70s, they had 11 55 kilowatt turbines. Um, so they've, you know, they're, they're into their, their uh, third repowering cycle right now, which is pretty, pretty significant. Um, so they're at 120% renewable. Um, they have a target of carbon neutrality by 2025. Um, and they've done a lot with uh, solar thermal, uh, hot water in regards to district heating, as you can see there, and they actually have these combined heat and power facilities um, with biogas uh, and and the, the solar hot water systems. So something we haven't seen in Australia is this, uh, you know, on mass solar hot hot water uh, facilities, but definitely something that that's pot has potential. Um, it's very, it's a very kind of dated technology throughout Denmark. So Samso Island is another one, um, and again, really fascinating because it's such a mature space. They hit their 100% renewable target by 2008, um, so it's it's old, you know, and they're now uh, moving on a on a um, fossil free by 2030 strategy. They're calling it Samso 3.0, and it's also um, it's not just about fossil free and you know creating biogas for their ferry and having a you know. A plant to support that on on land and and trying to transition all of the farming fuels uh, over to sustainable fuels. Um, they've they've also integrated a smart energy system because they're about to go through a, a repowering phase whereby you know their their turbines and their solar panels on land um, have have reached the end of their life. So they they're about to do a a, a new a new kind of strategy again. So they're in there second generation of 100% renewable. <clears throat> so I did go to a few larger cities. Um, Copenhagen, of course, it's, it's so iconic. Um, so many successful strategies around sustainability that are 
more broad than energy. So their, their cycling strategies and their incentives around that are, are really first class, world leading, um, very inspiring. Um, and they're well on track to meet their target in, in 2025. And a big, a big uh, aspect of what they've been doing is really showcasing the job creation that comes through a, a green transition. Um, I believe that they've, they've monitored and projected through to 2025 around their um, their energy efficiency job creation and they uh, and they estimate that it'll it'll come to about 30,000 um, full-time equivalents which is really just a huge statistic. Um, Verborn in Freiburg is another really interesting case study again it's a it's an army barrack uh, area of Freiburg that was brought back by the community and had a very visionary kind of plan to turn it into a bit of a satellite eco um, eco village essentially um, but you know 5,000 people live there um, so currently 65% of the energy needs are produced within the quarter um, and they have a, a zero emissions target by 2050 um, a big part of what they've done there has been around co-housing and how to have this closed loop system within co-housing um, and try and you know house people as closely as possible their feedback was, you know, it was easier to do there because it's such a new city, whereas when they try to, well, a new quarter, when they try and model it out to the rest of the board, which is, which is quite, um, you know, it's quite historical and old and has a lot of different overlays on it, it's really difficult because the, the question around generation becomes, becomes more difficult to answer, whereas the, the opportunity for retrofitting is much higher. Um, a lot of the areas that I went to said that the next generation for them in these kind of more mature energy landscapes is really about how to how to amplify the role of the region um, and that, that it's they're finding it very complex to kind of implement so you know what may work in one local government area once you try to kind of amplify it out it really isn't translating so for them their sort of feedback was you know in, in places where they've tried to do these regional plans it kind of has to operate on a superficial level. If, if they've tried to get too deep into it and to, to have too many agreements around it and too many, um, you know, kind of detailed plans, that they just haven't landed on a grassroots level and there's been a disconnect from it. So this, this sort of way to um, have things shared and a broad consensus but not have it too top-down was um, noted to be really, really uh, important. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of frameworks in regards to the process of, of zero net energy and just touch on a few um, that are popular over, over in Europe and successfully operating. So the first is the World Future Council. Um, so they, look, they've been working in the space for a few years. They've been collating um, data on 100% renewable communities across the world and trying to work out um, what is uniform. Of course, you know, when you're, when you're mapping a 100% renewable transition, uh, everything's very contextual and has to be very much, um, yeah, designed for the context. And, but, you know, there are principles and there are kind of guiding um, pathways and building blocks that, that they have found have emerged um, through their research. Um, so they've developed 10 blocks, uh, so 10 building blocks. Um, and they're things like developing a blueprint, promoting energy efficiency, identifying financial resources, engaging in networks, um, building community capacity, those sorts of things. But they've, they've provided some really good tools um, to think through uh, a 100% renewable transition. <clears throat> Probably one of the best uh, shires that I, I visited was Rinkhoving Skern, um, which has 67,000 people uh, across its municipality and the actual capital, Rinkhoving, has 5,000 people. Um, and they, look, they, they had a really well-established, um, well-networked, localised process. Um, so they called it the Energy Council, and the Energy Council they referred to as the heart of their energy transition. So they, um, you know, they have a 100% renewable electricity target. They're already, I believe, uh, they've just built another project since I've been back. So they're, they're close to their 70% target. Um, so they're 70% by 2016. 
Um, and they're, how it all kind of comes together is that they have their energy policy, which is called Rinko Being 2020, which underpins all of their activities. Um, and that was a policy that was very well cons um, consulted across the community. So they, they did a, a range of kind of community conversations. They got a lot of feedback and then they put forward this vision and just had it open in the, in the kind of town hall for many days for people to come and talk about it and, and give, um, yeah, give further feedback and, and share how they might like to be involved in it. Um, so from, from there, they have an action plan. Um, so they, they have 13 focus areas. It's things like technology focus areas, like wind, solar, biogas. They also have energy tourism, um, green entrepreneurship. Uh, yeah, and that's all kind of embedded in that action plan and it's uh, reviewed every three years. So it's on a three year kind of timeline. And they have a, a volunteer energy council that's made up of really key stakeholders around their local area. So, uh, you know, the local NGO representatives or sustainability groups, um, local industry, local business, um, yeah, local government, obviously. Uh, yeah, some, some key politicians. And that group really drives the strategy and the engagement and then delegates to a range of working groups and, and the municipality um, has a has two staff which which then support those um, those groups so they're called the energy secretariat um, another really great kind of variation um, was was in Totnes so Totnes is, is based uh, near Devon in the UK um, and you know that that's sort of where the transition town movement really came from so they really took a whole bunch of principles from the permaculture movement and redesigned them um, in, into this concept called the transition town um, movement and uh, they have a very strong focus on relocalization in regards to the economy and all other factors so their approach has been to do this local economic blueprint and it's really look it's really holistic um, it's a nine-step process uh, it's about you know, looking at the economic the economic context more broadly, and for each community to work out what's actually important to them. Um, but my my colleagues in in Totnes, when I asked them, because they have now replicated it through a range of other communities, and I asked them, does energy always come up? Does community energy always come up? And they said yes, that it it, it has been fundamental. Um, but some of the other aspects haven't come up as much. So for them. When they did their first one, it was really a focus on food, renewable energy, retrofitting, health and care. So another really key um, point of difference uh, from Australia was around um, the integration of biomass projects. So, you know, all the communities I went to had at least one small biomass project um, you know heating is is a really uh, big energy user as well for them so so you know we can understand why biomass is so prevalent and so necessary but um, really it's such a missing link in Australia and such a massive opportunity um, the use of straw to energy uh, was really significant um, wood chips to energy uh, and you know done in a way so that it, it's sustainably um, sustainably created as a feedstock. Um, so just on the role of government and policy in regards to 100% renewable transitions, so um, Stefan Schurig from the World Future Council, uh, I've just got a quote of his here where he really, and a lot of people talked about this, that, you know, it's nice that we have um, these targets of 40% in Victoria by 2025, and then we've got these, you know, carbon neutrality by 2050. But really, we, we do need to start being a lot more ambitious, and we need to be locking in these 100% renewable targets and locking them in early. Um, and there is a real uh, trepidation from government to do that, um, and it and it needs to be happening, uh, you know, a, a lot more a lot more frequently. So. Um, you know, it is possible, communities are doing it. Um, we should be doing it on a local level, but also, you know, on a, on a state and federal policy we, we, policy level, we need to lock in those, those targets and be more ambitious. Um, we know what the roadmap is now to carbon neutrality, so 100% renewable should fall in far earlier than that. <clears throat> so another um, 
really uh, important important framework that I saw through particularly in Germany, so particularly in Western Germany, um, is around the idea of having a voluntary planning criteria. So these are not, not uh, legally binding criteria, um, but they are they occur on a municipal level, so it's a local government basically putting together a criteria and saying, you know, to developers that are coming into their local area, we are open for business. We want development to happen here, but if you want to build renewables here, we want the projects to look like this. Um, and you don't have to do that, but, you know, as a community, we've decided this is what we would like. Um, and there were lots of different variations on those, and there was a heavy focus on community power. So community ownership, community investment, uh, and a range of, of things like that. Um, I've put in one example here, which is a, a community wind guideline from Steinfurt. Um, so this is uh, the area where Saarbeck is located in. Um, and so, you know, for wind development, they want to see really good community engagement uh, com and consultation. Um, they want to see participation opportunities in regards to ownership and investment. Um, and, a, and a guaranteed minimum equity share and not just for landowners uh, and a low minimum share access, so about a thousand euros so that most people could afford to do it um, and the inclusion of regional banks as financing partners. So I think these are really good uh, ideas for how, what we can ask our local governments to do um, as a way to, you know, better lead in to more, more community ownership and investment of, of the projects that are going to happen, especially in Victoria, because it's, it's, it's you know, about to boom right now. Um, so I won't go through this really long list of the role of banks. Um, I will also attach my, my Churchill report, or I believe Tom will attach my Churchill report to this after, after I'm done. Um, but look, there was a, a, a much stronger role of banks um, and what, what they have been able to provide than we've seen yet in Australia. Um, some of the interesting things were um, in regards to financing. Uh, so community groups, uh, because, because it's already proven, because they've, they've done a number of projects, at, you know, and there's, there's more kind of literacy around it in Europe. Community groups are now just progressing with a portfolio of potential projects for capital raising and banks are underwriting this. So they're sort of going to the bank and going, um, you know, we want to build 10 projects. They'll probably be solar. They'll probably be at sites like this. We'll look for this kind of return. Can you fund it? And we'll raise the capital with a community share offer over time. But we basically want to have the go ahead to just get on with it. And they're getting finance for that. Um, Another thing is that local governments have also set up really significant loans. So in Cornwall, uh, I believe I've got a $10 million loan facility for local community energy projects for, for, the, for the Shire of, of Cornwall, which is just very significant. Um, another really big one in regards to banking um, and the potential of, of regional banks was around um, this concept of citizen community energy finance products. So this really emerged in Rinkobing Skern, which was the, the municipality that I, that I talked about earlier. Um, that, that municipality is the homeland of Vestas, which is, you know, one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest uh, wind, uh, wind companies in the world, uh, the Danish Vestas company. Um, and, you know, the company was there. There were a range of uh, developments that were happening in the locality. Um, they were very much tied to a secure feed-in tariff and local citizens started going to their Rinkobing bank, and which is, you know, our equivalent of, of a Bank Australia or a Bendigo bank and saying, you know, this is a secure investment, but we don't have the money to invest, but we, we want to own, uh, you know, our local generator. Could you give us a standalone loan like you would for a car or, uh, you know, something similar to that, like a, a small loan? Um, and so they just started doing it informally and uh, now it's been rolled out all over Denmark and has started to go into to Germany. So some of the really key aspects of this, so, so the average investment is around 25,000 euros, um, but they said, you know, really they do do a lot at the 5,000 euro mark. Um, they have short terms, so seven to 12 years. 
they don't tie the loan to, to existing personal assets. It's very much tied to the income from the wind farm. So the income from the wind farm, the profit is more than the, the, the rate of interest back to the bank. So the customer makes money and the bank makes money. Um, and when I asked Ring Coping Bank, what, why did you do this? And why do you continue to do this? For them, it's really about customer acquisition. Um, so it's about keeping, you know, keeping uh, long-term customers because those 70 year 12 terms means you've, you've, got, you've got the opportunity for a conversation over, over the long term. So for them, it was very much a marketing strategy. They do loans like this for things like cars. Um, yeah, so it, you know, it uh, seems low risk for them. So it'd be fantastic uh, to unlock something like this through Australian banks, especially for communities that, you know, are going to have large scale development near them that will, you know, likely have a confirmed uh, income stream through things like auctions. Um, and, you know, maybe people in that community can't, uh, you know, afford a few thousand dollars to invest in, their, in that local um, generator. But if the local bank can provide a platform for them to have access, it's another pathway to enhance regional economic development. Um, so just as a bit of a snapshot, um, and I haven't talked through all of these things, but I have talked about some of them uh, throughout the presentation. So, you know, just what, what was apparent to me was that, that very important role of setting targets <clears throat> and setting targets at a local level, getting as local as possible, because the more local targets you have, the bigger the narrative for those regions or the state-based targets. It, it's an influencer factor and it's about having that local local responsibility and trying to attract as much benefit um, within your local community. Um, having a blueprint, knowing the pathway, knowing the projects to get there, that's all really important. Um, the role of lighthouse communities as well as having regional approaches was also really key. So communities that can get there as quickly as possible uh, and then be a lighthouse to the, you know, to, to other surrounding communities is really, was really important for a lot of the learnings in Europe. Um, Again, as mentioned, the role that biomass and bioenergy plays in the European energy transition. Um, the next one's really interesting. So communities can take back the power and transition older commercial generators into community assets. So this came out of um, the UK, whereby they are now in a position that we were in, you know, a, a few years ago in regards to having a very conservative um, government in charge and all of the, the benefits for community energy have been removed. So the community feed-in tariff has been removed. The support mechanisms um, and the support agencies have been defunded. Um, and what's happening now is, is that, uh, so there was three examples of communities doing this, but there's now a law firm that's been set up to help um, navigate this uh, in, a, in a more formal way. Uh, so communities are, are going to local commercial projects, so, you know, larger projects and saying, you know, you've been operating now for five to seven years, you've made your money back. Could we as a community um, buy out, uh, you know, buy back this project essentially, so buy out the, the commercial owner and could we do a transition process um, with legal and other assistance so that we have the community capacity to be local asset managers instead of the assets being managed out of London or, or some of the bigger cities like Manchester. And, you know, the community is happy to accept lower rates of return on that um, than a commercial kind of, you know, finance company would. So the community takes a lower return, but they redesign the whole back end so that it creates more local jobs um, and, and just has a, has a different, a different makeup, a different framework for the balance of its life. So that, thought that was really interesting. So, you know, what do you do when, um, you know, when, when the pathways narrow around what, what, what's possible? Um, and that, I think that's a really innovative approach. Um, so how technology is changing the game in regards to community grids and, and local low consumption was also really interesting. Um, so, you know, the ability now for these local feed-in tariffs and these more, um, you know, these technologies like simulating virtual net metering where, you know, uh, what you generate locally, you can share around and consume locally was, was a big one. 
Um, the social risk of high renewable penetration of community benefits aren't fundamental to each project. So this was very interesting also in the case of Rinko being, which I mentioned earlier, and Rinko being had, um, it is, you know, the motherland of Vestas. I think they've done some social mapping around the, 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 uh, the connection of Vestas to the local community. So in a population of 67,000, 2,000 people are employed by Vestas and 20,000 people are either family members or work for companies that supply Vestas. So, you know, you're talking a third of the population is directly touched by Vestas. Um, but still, Rinkobing is one of the biggest places for opposition to wind at the moment. And that's really because there is one project that is going to take them to their 100% renewable target. And it's been bought out by a uh, Swedish um, utility called Vattenfall. And the community really doesn't like their approach. Vattenfall's approach is instead of creating a community fund and a benefit sharing um, program for the local community and doing really good community engagement, they've essentially bought out 20 houses in a village and really fragmented a local community. So it's a massive hotspot at the moment. Um, so, you know, even though there's so much um, benefit from wind energy in that area, just takes one developer to really do, uh, you know, to really approach things in a way that the community doesn't like for there to, to be a, a, you know, a backlash to the transition. Um, so the role of municipality frameworks for planning and stimulating community energy, I've touched on that. Um, I think it's a really big opportunity for, local governments in Australia, um, you know, especially as a way for them to secure as much benefit as possible from the coming energy transition. Um, and the last one is just that community groups or councils can lead. We're certainly seeing a lot of that uh, in, Aust in Australia. There, there is this real kind of division. It's either the community energy group or the council, um, but certainly the communities that I went to, the fastest transitions um, had occurred when there's a very complementary partnership um, and a very, yeah, a very shared um, process. Cool. So I might leave it there. Taryn, that is absolutely incredible. Um, there's so many, there's so many dimensions to all of that. It, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't even know where to begin. Um, there haven't been any questions come through. So the field is right open, everyone. If you've got a question, um, just throw it in and it'll definitely get answered. Um, and if you don't, can't figure out where to find the Q&A, feel free to dump it in the chat panel. Um, so, um, maybe you could talk a little bit more, Taryn, about, I mean, you covered some, you know, transferring these lessons to Australia or what's applicable to Australia. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what you think is the most sort of relevant parts of this to an Australian context? Off the cuff, if I can put you on the spot. Yeah, what, what's the most relevant? Um, absolutely, yeah. Look, I, th I think we, we really need to have targets and blueprints set at a very localised level. I think it's really important. I think we need to know what's going on. We need to know uh, where we're at in regards to local um, renewable generation and consumption. And we need to be able to have some narrative points so that we can, you know, at a local level, build a story around where we're going to and what those project pathways are. So yeah. at the moment in Australia, we're really focused on the project by project approach. And I think we need to be more strategic than that. And look, the, the, over in Europe, what's happened is that it's been very much this focus on stationary energy and heat. And then once communities have um, achieved that, they then move into other aspects like transport and food systems and, you know, carbon sequestration and other things. Um, and that's certainly, you know, what's been happening in, in Austria uh, where they, you know, it's this very kind of step-by-step -step transition. But we, we have the opportunity to really model out and lead across all of those things. Um, simultaneously and to have them be a really integrated approach. So, yeah, I'd like to see more of that in the Australian space. Okay, that's, yeah, yeah, I would like that too. Um, and, and for me, really, the theme that's coming through very strongly, or a theme that's coming through very strongly is, is local, local planning, local determination, local, locals getting upset when external people are coming yeah. in with their external approaches. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah. So Richard's asked a question, are these community projects still connected to regional or national or even international grids? In Australia, states are facing criticism for setting state targets different to national targets. How does this play out in Europe? I definitely think you can answer this one. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so mo most of them are all connected, um, apart from one of the islands that wasn't connected. Um, but, yeah, mo all of them were, were connected to the national grid and those national grids are interconnected across Europe. Um, <coughs> so they have community grids. So when I say they own their community grid, it's very much their local grid. Um, but for them, they, you know, the, as soon as they start importing from the national grid, it costs them more. So there's, there is a real incentive for them to try and get their, their local community to utilise when they're generating. Um, so that's sort of the, the next wave of things. There was, there was a lot of trials around blockchain occurring as well to try and stimulate that. So, yeah, I think, look, I think that's, that's definitely uh, a big factor. Um, in regards to setting targets, so no, there is very much this this separate target setting. Um, the EU comes together and has a uniform one, but certainly in Germany, uh, you know, there's a, there's a state called Northwest Rhinefalia and they are really the leaders in the transition in Germany. Um, and they, <coughs> they have basically said on a, for, a, for a, a regional level that they need to allocate 1.6% of the land uh, for renewable energy generation. So that is for, you know, what they would call kind of large scale wind and solar. We'd probably call it mid scale here. Um, and so, so their, their strategy was to say, you know, as a region, we want to see 1.6% allocated. You can either do it at a, at a local level and, and get, gain as much benefit as you want from it. Um, or you guys can start to trade your 1.6%. So in some, in some municipalities, there's a lot of opposition. They don't want, they're a bit saturated. They don't want more, more development. And in other communities, you know, they really want that development. So they said that the interesting thing is that there is this kind of broader strategy, but they're actually kind of starting to trade within it. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. And you touched on something there, which was around these, well, you mentioned blockchain. And then one of the ones you specifically mentioned as, as, as an example was this variable feed-in tariff. And yeah and encouraging the customers to use less, more energy at the time of peak renewable production, windy, sunny days. Um, that's totally optional, right? People, people are responding to that because, the, because it's up to them if they want to. Yeah, well, no, in, so in Wolfhagen, it was, um, in Wolfhagen, basically people, people who took part in a pilot received um, a new washing machine, a new dishwasher, uh, oh. A new kettle, and all of those those um, appliances were connected to the variable feeding tariff, and they could pre-select options. So if they weren't home, they could yeah. leave in the morning and say, "I've put a load in. When it's beep, turn it on." Great. And all of those would turn on. Um, in regards to blockchain, where it was really starting to emerge was in Denmark. In regards to the repowering state that people are finding themselves so you know their generators are aging they need to put new ones in um, the new ones are likely going to go have to go in with that being subsidy free so you know the feed-in tariffs have ended there's limited options the technology is cheap um, but if you want to do small scale they need to, to make it um, the business case stack up better and and try and use it locally and and utilize blockchain to do that so there was a number of research projects and trials going on around that Awesome. No more questions. I'm going to ask a couple more because they have got lots of questions. Um, you mentioned a farmer's co-op and, and, and how that was a relevant thing in, it must have been one of the first ones you mentioned that started with an S. Um, uh, anyway, it's not about the farm. Yeah, yeah, Sarbeck, that's right. It's not about the farmer's co-ops, but I, I, I'm a fan of co-ops <laughs> and I'm interested in what role you saw energy co-ops are playing in the 100% town examples that you saw. The 100 so, so almost, look, throughout um, mainland Europe, all of the communities that I went, that I went to were utilising co-ops. Yep. So um, that, that was the major legal framework um, that, that the community portion was, in, was, was you know, working from. Um, within the UK, they have their slightly different 
uh, model. Um, what is it called? The community community benefit companies, benefit. I believe they're yeah, called. Yeah, exactly. Which which is very similar. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So very strong cooperative movement. Um, very normalised, um, very normalised across different sectors and different aspects of projects. As I said, you know, like with the with the farmers, the, the farmers co-op, like those things are very, very common in regards to, to milk and other agricultural aspects. Um, I can see another question here. Did electric cars play a role in grid management in any area? Yeah, good question. Yeah, in regards to energy storage. Yeah, so this, um, I've, I've done a little thing on this in my report as well. So in uh, Wolfhagen, again, um, so they, they have a great benefit sharing model whereby they basically give subsidies to their members for, um, uh, you know, sort of energy efficient white goods and uh, e-bikes and, you know, uh, kind of more, more sort of on a household level, more, more usable things. And they've, they've just done a, a, a pilot with um, two electric vehicles um, which were subsidised for two members to be able to use with, with branding. They had to have branding from the energy co-op on it. But basically they, they wanted to pilot, you know, um, how can they uh, start to use it as a, as a, as a designated uh, energy storage option and have them so track where they go every day and make recommendations about where they should go, uh, where, where they should park their car and plug in um, to charge and when when can they, uh, you know, sort of be used as a, as a battery option. So they're definitely doing trials, but they're, they're quite small scale. But the plan is for them, you know, I, I think they said that they estimate they'll be at 50% EV within a three to five year period. Um, wow. and so yeah. So for them, they, you know, the, the energy storage option is, is really high. Mm. Cool. Um, no more questions have come through. So I'm going to ask one sort of one question about about what you saw, and then a final wrap up question. Unless somebody else throws theirs in the mix. Um, look, I'm really interested in this. How do we balance the need for external support that is just genuinely appropriate under some circumstances versus making sure that communities are genuinely empowered and that they are in control and that they're given the opportunity to build their capacities. Um, and this for me touches on, you know, all of those things that have kept on coming out about communities wanting to do it themselves, the local, pl local planning, local target setting, um, external people coming in, not being well received. Um, but I do still think there needs to be some, under some circumstances, there is expertise that exists outside of a community. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, especially now that you've seen what you've seen. Absolutely. And I haven't, look, I haven't talked about it today, but it's, it is in my, my report around the role of support agencies. And that, that was very prevalent. You know, there has been, whether they're government or not-for-profit or, you know, funded support agencies really playing that middle role. So that's sort of more leading from behind, you know, not being the, the centrepiece, but, but really building that community capacity and helping give them advice. There was, that was happening all over the place. Um, it was very rare that there was a community that, that just did it off their own bat. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some communities want to be fully empowered and have those local jobs and take control like that. And others just don't. They don't want that complexity. They, they want to get there, but they don't want to be um, left with the onerous responsibility afterwards. You know, so it's very contextual, I think, um, in regards to what will suit a community and, and who actually wants, wants to do what. Um, yeah, but certainly, you know, I, I hear conflicting things um, from Wolfhagen, uh, you know, from the chair there, you know, she'd be, she'd say, you know, we're up for the, for the mission of getting here, but we don't, we don't want so much the ongoing challenge of having to own an operator. We just sort of want to do good things for our community. Um, whereas other, you know, the fact that in the hmm. UK, they're really trying to re, they're trying to buy out commercial generators and redesign them. Hmm. Uh, I think that's, that's really interesting. So I think it's very specific per community. What, yeah. What, what the role is and, and what the long-term kind of role is as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and the final question I have, how do you think you've changed as a result uh, of the trip? Uh, yeah. I mean, the, Ch the Churchill Fellowship is an amazing program. You're the 
well, at least the third, you know, mm. community energy leader that's done a church or fellowship. And we, you know, we see these, we see these people coming back and, you know, take, take with a new perspective. And I'm, I'm really interested in that. What, 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 what do you think has changed about you as a result of this? Um, look, I think for me, first, it was really nice to have a break <laughs> for a few months. Like, thank you. Was it a break? <laughs> thank you to Hepburn Wind for, you know, letting me off for a few months. That was great. Um, and then, look, for me, you know, I didn't learn anything that was really, really, really new and, and big, but I learned so many little things. And um, I think, you know, it's just helped my confidence. Obviously, we've got a pretty big ambition in the Hepburn Shire, and it's just really helped my confidence to understand um, with depth how these things happen, how you just start rolling out more projects, how it's possible. Um, so on a confidence level, I think, I think it's really positive for me. Um, and, you know, what was really exciting was that I went to so many places and they knew about Hepburn. Mm -hmm. They've seen our murals. Um, we were, we're a case study in multiple universities throughout Europe. And that was just so shocking. Like I would go to people's offices and they would have photos up in their office and I thought they'd done it for me because I was coming for the day. And they were like, no, we have these here. <laughs> that was really nice. So is it not common for communities to name their turbines and to commission artists to put beautiful art on their no, renewable energy? No, no. And I think, um, you know, an issue for, especially in Germany, um, especially in Germany and Denmark, is that now they're going through the repowering phase. Um, a lot of the people who helped get the projects up were, you know, very skilled, retired people um, who, you know, put in a lot of time and money originally who are now really elderly and there wasn't a strong focus on um, youth and innovation and opportunities for young people and professionalising the sector and having jobs around it. And, you know, they, they're, they're struggling to approach the repowering phase because there is a disconnection in the community. There's ownership, but there's disconnection. Uh, so, you know, they really talked about, uh, you know, that, it's, that it appears like we you know, we do do things in a really innovative way and that we engage our community and, you know, even just showing them videos from the C4CE Congress, people were so shocked at the amount of young people and the amount of women there. Really? Yeah. And I thought that was really cool. Old, reti old retired engineers. <laughs> nothing, wrong, nothing wrong with old retired engineers, but, yep. uh, yeah, <laughs> we need yeah. diversity. Okay, Taryn, that's been absolutely wonderful. So a reminder to everybody else that we've still got a bunch of webinars to go. And um, if, if, if I'm not exhausted, then you're not allowed to be exhausted yet. And we've got, we've got some really exciting topics coming up. So get onto the website, c4ce.net. Dot au. Um, we will be posting the recording for this webinar as soon as possible, probably tomorrow, um, and we'll include with that a link to Taryn's Churchill report. So thanks again, Taryn. Thanks so much, Tom. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.